Security is no longer a back office question. It's no longer the question you ask right before you put code into production. I think everybody realizes that, um, you know, not getting security right, it creates an existential problem for the business. And so to do that, we as leaders, we have to adapt and shift our mindset. This is a Security Weekly production. Security Weekly is a resource of Cyber Risk Alliance. The Cybersecurity Collaborative and WIDS is proud to present CISO Stories. Each week, CISO Stories takes a deep dive on security leadership with one of the contributors to my latest book, the best-selling CISO Compass Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers, as well as from other top CISOs and security thought leaders. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC or visit cyberleadersunite.com. I am your host, Todd Fitzgerald, and this week we welcome Rob Duhart Jr., VP and Deputy CISO and e-commerce CISO at Walmart. I think in our business, we talk a lot about adversary mindset. And I think, you know, depending on who you ask in my family, Todd, I've always had an adversary mindset. Now that worked out well coming to this business, but maybe less so when I was in school and with my parents, right? Um, I I don't know. I think there's a unique way uh, that many of us cyber professionals and leaders think. uh, Worst case scenario, how would a bad guy want to take advantage of us? Uh, And that was just kind of in my blood. And so stumbled across it. At a young age, had the opportunity to uh, intern for the United States government, the Department of Energy to be precise, um, and felt the centrifugal force that continuously pulled me back to cyber. Um, Attempted to leave at least once, uh, potentially twice, and it just continued to pull me back, Todd. And here we are, however many years later, uh, with an opportunity to make it into a career. But I'll tell you, Todd, when I started uh, the second phase of my journey at the FBI, I would have never guessed that our business would be what it is today. And and nobody else would have either. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's great that we we have a career today that, you know, a lot of people are trying to figure this out and uh, you know, where do where do people where do people fit uh within that uh, in the past? It's true. I I um crimes against children and digital forensics is where I started. Uh, and coming out of the academy, nobody really wanted to do that work for all the obvious reasons. It's hard, hard work. Uh, nobody knew that there was this role called the CISO that would one day emerge from the ashes of digital forensics and, you know, what wasn't called ATP at the time, but, you know, um, advanced persistent threats, APT. Here we are. Uh, I think some of us just got lucky. What do they say? Some of us were chosen <laughs> versus <Yeah>. chosen. <laughs> Um, I feel fortunate to have had the opportunities to do the things that we do. So, so where do you feel your skills are are best at right now? Are they at being a CISO or are they at perfecting that smoked brisket? <laughs> well, you know, uh, we're fortunate to have a phenomenal team, which means <laughs> I do get some time on the weekends to continue my craft. Um, so I'd say about 50, 50. I, I just have to ask, yeah, cause, cause my, my son got a, a one of those Traeger grills with the wood yeah. pellets and everything. I, I'm wondering what, what do you use? Is there, is there any a recommendation there? I have a similar uh, pellet grill. It, it almost makes it foolproof, Todd, but when it comes to brisket, there's no such thing as foolproof. <laughs> it's the bark, whether it's wrapping in pink butcher paper, you know, foil or no foil, uh, how long you let it rest. There's there's always something interesting. But I do find this, Todd, that we as as leaders in security, we all have some type of inc- eccentric, you know, side area of focus that is probably closer to our obsession with security than we care to admit. <laughs> well, well, I'm jealous because I've always wanted to get into smoking and stuff. And uh, it, it just has never happened. Uh, Come to rest and- in. I'll make one for you. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to take you up on that. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, security at scale. 
yeah. how Walmart builds trust, starting with cybersecurity. I mean, Walmart is obviously a very, very large organization. Uh, wh- why don't you walk us through what you mean by that? Yeah, well, look, trust is just at the cornerstone of, of everything we do at Walmart. Um, before I jump into the technical answer, one of my favorite stories that was told to me coming into Walmart was how, you know, there are these photos from Hurricane Katrina where, you know, there were lines of cars leaving New Orleans and, you know, the battered area. And then on the opposite direction, there were lines of Walmart trucks driving in to the area, right? So so running to the crisis instead of from the crisis. Um, and a part of that is a representation of the trust that we've earned from uh, American society, our government and beyond. So look, trust is, is essential. Um, and our role as cybersecurity leaders and professionals is about protecting the trust that, we, that, that we've earned over these years and we hope to continue to earn. Um, Walmart scale, so look, 10,000 plus stores, um, 24 countries. So Todd, I just got back from Mexico City and Toronto, Canada. Um, you know, we do multi tens of billions of dollars in revenue in Mexico and in Canada. Um, earlier this year, I was in South Africa um, because we also have a relationship with one of the larger retailers in South Africa. So when we talk about Walmart scale, I thought I understood it, Todd, um, but it, it, it kind of pales in even my expectations. Um, I can give you a pretty interesting technical example, if you like. Sure. So w- one of the roles that I, I have is to be um, the CISO of e-commerce. And as in that role, we own all of the protections around our, our e-commerce platforms. And a part of that is blocking bots right? We call them Grinch bots. We regularly block, last year at least, over a billion bots a month. Oh. And that's, that's, it's staggering when you think about what that actually means. Um, so again, look, security at scale, you know, um, I haven't been a lot of small places, right? Ford, Cardinal Health, Google, all very large places with, with large threats, large threat surface. Um, but this does put that on a completely different scale. 2.2 million associates, Todd, um, not just in America, but spread across the world. I'd argue probably 800,000, at least outside of the United States. Um, what are these, what are these bots primarily trying to do? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and to be precise, the number is 8.5 billion. So I, I should have said that versus just 1 billion. Um, we call them Grinch bots because, they're focused on acquiring products. And so in many cases on our website and otherwise, we sell items that are of great value on the gray or black market. Um, And so many of these are resellers who are seeking to get PS5s, um, trading cards, you name it, um, through what we call hype sales and, and trying to cheat the system that we've created to enable individuals to buy them. Right. Because, Todd, I want you to be able to buy a PS5, not, you know, a reseller to be able to buy a thousand of them from us. And so we call them Grinch bots because we see a lot of that activity around Christmas and around the holidays. Um, And our goal is to be able to put product in the hands of our customers that trust us versus um, in the hands of the resellers that want to take advantage. And again, you'll hear this as a theme, keeping the customer at the center of everything that we do especially in infosec is a huge part of what we are our business what sort of what sort of automation do, do you need to have in place to to help you know take care of that threat? in our business you know everyone talks about artificial intelligence and machine learning and you know while that's all really valuable and we spend a lot of time thinking about that as well what we're seeing from these grinch bots todd is that and there's a broad democratization of access to tools and technology that 10 years ago were, were very bespoke, limited to the dark web. So now, I mean, you can go online and if you really have been dying to get a PlayStation 5, potentially, you know, pay a certain fee and get a software as a service application that basically makes anybody a Grinch bot, right? Um, to enable people to be able to buy what they want to buy. And so with the democratization of that technology and how quickly it, it moves, 
we have to do the same in our business. And so, yes, there's tons and tons of automation on the basis of the information we know about our customers um, to help us make sure that the right people are getting the right thing at the right time. Mm-hmm. So how do you, how do you manage, uh, you know, how many security products would you, would you say that, that, you know, you would have in your arsenal that are taking care of these things? It's a, that's a finesse, fantastic question. I think, um, You know, while I won't get into the numbers, I would say that it's a large number. (laughs) We have we have a lot of them. Um, You know, many times we partner with vendors um, who are building products that meet the needs that we have um, and then spend a lot of time scaling those products. Right. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense for a vendor to build a tool that can handle eight point five billion bot attempts a month. There's just not that many organizations in the world that have that problem. So the business case isn't super strong. Um, But in partnership, we've done some pretty amazing things in terms of taking an existing product and modifying it. On the other side, we often spend a lot of time building our own tool sets. And so, you know, obviously, when you think of a Google or something like that, people, I think, often, you know, envision a bunch of PhDs running around doing a lot of really great technical work. Well, Walmart, we have quite a few PhDs as well. Um, and we're really proud of some of the work that they've done, many of which impacts this space where we're leveraging advanced com- computational models um, to really scale our ability to dynamically protect our users and protect our customers. Because again, uh, the customer first and the customer's at the center of what we do. And, and we take that very, very seriously. I remember uh, years ago, I, I started out uh, managing database administrators. and. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was working for American Airlines at the time, and there was just a, a handful of companies that were that that were looking at the scale issue. Uh, Citibank was one of them. Walmart was another one. American Airlines was another one. Uh, and we had these Teradata machines, um, and they were, you know, they were massively parallel, large processors. And they called them Teradata because each each node had a terabyte of of information on them right <laughs> but the, but these were you know costing several million dollars a piece you know now we have the the terabyte drive that we stick in our laptop bag uh that's multiple terabytes right but but it was all about that it was it was doing those things that that are pushing that envelope that that other companies just just aren't doing you're spot on, Todd. And I love your example about American Airlines. Um, you know, it makes me think of what a Ticketmaster went through earlier this year, right? The rush to go buy tickets for Taylor Swift concerts. Um, we, we call that a hype sale problem, but there's some organizations that struggle with it. Um, the example, the aforementioned example I gave you of some of the, the, the work that our internal teams have built, some of this we open source. Right. And so we take some of the capabilities you describe, we open source it um, and and share and or, you know, allow others to adopt it to solve similar problems, perhaps not on the same scale, um, but really making the community better, which I hear you described in, in that previous example as well. The article this podcast is based upon can be viewed in the best-selling cybersecurity leadership book, CISO Compass, Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers. Where, where do you see the the biggest areas that, that you're focused on? Is it, is, it, is it DDoS type attacks? Is it ransomware attacks? Or, you know, where do you see the you know, the biggest threats that you're having to, to worry about. Is it a cheat to say all of the above? <laughs> <laughs> you, have to, you have to, you have to pick or order or, you know, have some sort of priority in, in your mind that, that you're most focused on. You've heard this, right? A, a crown jewels approach, right? And thinking about what services and capabilities are core to our functioning as a company. So I think we start there. I think we think about, um, you know, what day-to-day capabilities are essential for Walmart and how do we make sure that we're preserving availability to those? Um, in that ra- realm, definitely DDoS is, is something we think quite a bit about and something we're concerned about. 
you know, we observe a number of them uh, regularly. And, you know, knock on wood, we haven't had many instances where we've had significant outages relating to it. Um, but I think the second ring would be, um, you know, preserving our ability to serve the customer, right? And so in e-commerce, right, if your website is down, you can't serve the customer, right? If your orders per minute are down, there's customers that want to do business with you that can't. And, um, you know, in some businesses, that's a luxury, right? Doing business with, with you, with, with, you know, Walmart maybe as a luxury, but in many cases, we find that it's a requirement. In my aforementioned, um, Hurricane Katrina example, if people can't buy milk from us, they may not be able to get it anywhere, right? And so we very much think of um, our ability to provide access to the customer um, as, as one that's essential to our overall mission as a company. Um, and that gets the attention from the highest levels of the company as well. So um, I would say all of the above, but we're definitely deeply concerned about both availability concerns um, and integrity concerns. And I'd put rant somewhere in the integrity side of that mm -hmm. equation. I, it, when you mentioned Katrina, it takes me back. I remember I was on a panel right after uh, Hurricane Katrina. And uh, there was one other individual on the panel who was talking about uh, things that you just don't think about when you're in, a, in an emergency like that. Uh, there was a hospital that, that was running... Uh, and they had the backup generators and they were doing fine. Uh, but the problem was it was four days into it and people weren't able to come in and out. And so they were running out of gas uh, and they needed gas. And so the, the story he was telling was the CFO took $15,000 and they went out and they flagged down a tanker truck <laughs> and, and they got fuel. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so they they you, you did what you had to do to 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 get to get product in there. So I, I think we uh, a lot of times we think in oh disaster recovery it's going to be this orderly we do this we do that and then it's like well that doesn't work if the bridges are closed. It's absolutely true, right? If I can't get power into a store, it doesn't matter if I'm getting DDoSed or not. Right. If you're, you're what there were some disasters in the southern United States the last couple of days and, and Walmart is mobilizing around supporting those communities the best we possibly can. You know, um, it, it's really humbling, Todd, when you know that your colleagues are, are, are really focused on putting, you know, formula in the hands of mothers um, and whether or not we do our job is an essential component of that. Again, it gets back to trust our, our merchants and our store operators can't earn that trust if we aren't doing our jobs day in and day out and if there's a reason why i can't you know smoke my brisket on the weekend it's because i'm thinking about these types of things and it has a different meaning todd than maybe it did in the past yeah. um, and, in a good way and it's it's funny i, I remember last fall the uh, uh one of the 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 grill manufacturers that now that we've gone to these smart grills Mm -hmm. uh, and and everything with your phone and stuff that that the system was down and and people needed that were trying to smoke their turkeys but their but their now their app wasn't working uh, and and it you know when you have an event like that you see how how critical the the technology is with that have have you ever figured out um, with Walmart like I mean this must just be massive what 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 uh, what it would cost for an hour of downtime? You know, I'm sure smarter minds than I have that equation down and can pull out a number. I cannot. But what I can tell you is the description that you gave of the need for edge versus cloud and low latency connection is an everyday reality for our stores, right? If your store in, you know, I'm trying to think of a remote place. My, my family's from Tennessee. So in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, um, you know, right outside of Knoxville, you may not always have, you know, a, a fiber connection to the cloud, right? And so in these cases, yeah, we absolutely have to think about how does our store, how does a, a very large money-making portion of our enterprise function with limited connectivity? Um, and it's a problem that, you know, I haven't had to think of a lot in my career outside of when I was in the government. 
Um, it is very similar, like if you're in, Af in Afghanistan or you're someplace remote and you need to upload a gigabyte file, how do you do it yeah. <laughs> without it taking seven yeah. days or, you know, three weeks? I mean, sometimes it just takes three weeks. Um, but at the end of the day, we have to make sure moms and dads can put food on the table um, every day uh, across America and across the globe. So, Todd, you, you make a great point about the cost of, of lack of availability for us. It is very high. And it's one of the reasons we invest so much in our capability mm -hmm. and why trust matters so much. Yeah. Because nothing's worse than walking into a store and being told, we're sorry, we can't serve you. Our technology isn't working. Yeah, and that I is think some, what we're saying. Go ahead. And I think some, sometimes as security professionals, we think it has to be, you know, all, uh, you know, that we have to do all these security controls. And you mentioned a low latency, and it reminds me, I just did a recent podcast with Ross Leo. And Ross Leo was the... Um, uh, chief security architect uh, for the uh, Johnson Space Control Center uh, you know, back in the days when we were launching rockets. And, and he goes through this story. I won't mention the whole story, but he talks about how they had to get uh, information back and forth between the, the, the space shuttle uh, and they wanted it encrypted uh, so it couldn't be tampered with. But the problem was the, the technology at the time wasn't supporting a, a very high level of encryption. Uh, so they had, to, they had to make some changes uh, to, to, to make that happen. And I think no matter how much technology we have at the moment, there's always, you know, there's always something that people get used to and depend on uh, that, that we, have to, we have to make some uh you know, some trade-offs for. A, a thousand percent. And to your point, right, thinking proactively, you know, maybe it's not an issue for our availability today, but what will be an issue to our availability tomorrow, right? Um, if I'm doing, you know, online order fulfillment, you probably need Wi-Fi, right? Or at least 3G, 4G, right? Because these devices have to check groceries in and out of an order. Our, our world is becoming more complex and the point you made about Johnson Space Center is a fascinating one. Mm -hmm. I feel like we're all going to be in this business at some point if we aren't already. Absolutely. Well, uh, Rob, this has been great. Uh, I've really enjoyed the conversation here. What what advice would would you give to CISOs as they're, you know, whether they're emerging CISOs, current CISOs, experienced CISOs, you know, as they're going down this journey and as they're, they're, you know, trying to keep their own organizations uh, up and uh, available? You know, I, I think rapidly, folks like you and, and others have been saying this for a while, but it's, it's coming faster than I think many of us realize. Security is a business imperative, right? I, on, on my trip down to Mexico and Canada, um, it was, it was really impressive to see the degree to which Security is no longer a back office question. It's no longer the question you ask right before you put code into production. I think everybody realizes that, um, you know, not getting security right, it creates an existential problem for the business. And so to do that, we as leaders, we have to adapt and shift our mindset. Um, I don't nearly get to play in the technology as much as I like anymore. Um, my job is to hire the great, bright people, empower and enable them learn from people like Jerry Geisler, who I'm fortunate to be able to work with, um, and, and create an environment where people can thrive. And to do that well, you need diversity of thought. Uh, you need diversity of a lot of other categories as well. Um, I love to talk about the, 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 the history of our business, Todd, how people like Ada Lovelace and you know uh, Grace Hopper really innovated in the cryptography industry hundreds of years ago and, and now we talk about having a deficit of women in our business. Um, again, finding our geniuses in our own backyard has to be a mission critical imperative for CISOs. And one can call that diversity. One can call it whatever you want. But I do believe it will become an existential question for those of us that lead these great teams. And then finally, look, it's not just about cyber. It's about trust. At the end of the day, do your users trust that you'll be a good steward of their information, of their data, and of their money? Uh, and if that answer isn't yes, then we as leaders are failing. Mm -hmm. And so three things, trust, 
diversity of thought and, and really empowering our teams to represent the adversaries we face. Uh, and then recognizing that security is a business imperative and a business driver, not just a technical driver. Yeah, I I, I think that's very important. And I think if we look at, uh, I've done a lot of speaking with ISACA over the years, and ISACA has embraced the whole digital trust and building that trust in IT systems and exactly that path you're talking about. Grace Hopper, I was fortunate enough to actually get to see her speak years oh ago I, this is way back when i was at american airlines they brought her in uh and and had her give a presentation uh and I, and i still i can still those are like moments that you just remember this this is somebody that's really important um you know to the, to the whole computing field uh it, you know and we have we have those legacies i i think to just that we can that we can build on just have one one quick question for you in terms of, of like you know recruiting um at yeah. walmart I, I, are are you doing anything different today or or how how are you finding people to you know come to walmart and and, and work for you obviously i think there's probably a big draw to come to walmart but but are are you doing different things to to try to tap into all these different areas? We absolutely are. Um, and it's a part of what I love about Walmart and part of what makes us unique. Uh, first and foremost, we realize that some of our geniuses are in our own backyard. And so we invest a lot of time and energy towards uh, cross training and, and enabling other associates at Walmart of our two point however million associates at Walmart to consider and pursue careers in cybersecurity, right? We have a program we call Live Better You, where we pay for certificates, uh, undergraduate degrees, and sometimes graduate certificates um, for people who want to break into other industries. Um, and cyber is a huge part of it. Every quarter, we have a discussion with hundreds of associates across the country who are studying cybersecurity. And our goal is to convert as many of those folks um, awesome. to be full-time cyber cyber employees for us because they know our business and they care. Some of these people have been, you know, pharmacists. Some of them have been, you know, very highly educated folks um, that have a passion and have developed a passion for cyber. And so cross-training and non-traditional programs is a huge investment area. I, I think that's an awesome idea. So, well, and it's not thanks. just us, by the way. Walmart does this across multiple disciplines. We're just proud to benefit from it. Yeah, that that's excellent. Well, thanks a lot today, Rob. Uh, thanks for your time. I know you're a busy guy, so um, thanks a lot. Todd, absolute pleasure. Thank you. Visit more CISO Stories podcasts on securityweekly.com, where you will find an index to prior episodes. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC or visit cyberleadersunite.com. Wiz is on a mission to help every organization rapidly identify and remove critical risks in their cloud environments. Purpose-built for the cloud, Wiz delivers full-stack visibility, accurate risk prioritization, and enhanced business agility. Wiz connects in minutes using an agentless approach that scans both platform configurations and inside every workload. We perform a deep assessment that goes beyond what standalone CSPM and CWPP tools offer to find the toxic combination of flaws that represent real risk. To learn more about Wiz, please visit securityweekly.com slash Wiz.